Philadelphia is steep in broadcast history. From the early pioneering days of broadcasting in the 1920s to today, Philadelphia has always been at the forefront. The Delaware Valley has been home to some of the best local programming in the country, starting with the early soap operas and children's shows to pioneering the best news formats in the country, much of it all began right here. From radio announcers to television personalities, cameramen to directors, these were the broadcasters that burned up the airwaves. These were the pioneers of Philadelphia Broadcasting. Welcome once again to Pioneers of Philadelphia Broadcasting. I'm Mike Strug, and our guest today is someone whose name you may not be familiar with. Often on this program, we have uh, people you've seen on TV, you've heard on radio. This is a gentleman who, who has made it happen. He's made it happen uh, on radio for almost 40 years as a manager. We're talking with Jim Loftus. Jim, welcome to the program. Thank you very much. Yeah. It's really it, an honor to be here. Yeah, it's really good to see you. And you deal with a part of, of the industry that, quite honestly, uh, those of us who are in front of the camera are unfamiliar with. We just go out and presume the microphone works if it's radio and uh, gets out on the air somehow. Uh, same is true with television. Somehow it gets out. You're the guy that makes it happen. Uh, first of all, tell us a little bit about your career. You're originally from upstate Pennsylvania. I am. Uh, I've been in the radio business uh, since 1977, 39 years. Uh, like so many, you know, kids uh, that were enamored by the pop explosion of radio in the 60s and 70s, so I grew up listening to Top 40 radio and was so excited, and uh, you know, the the way that it came onto the scene and the, the explosion of, uh, you know, Top 40 radio and uh, formatted radio, how things changed, uh, you know, sort of uh, in the beginning uh, uh, in my generation, and uh, I was enamored by it from uh, from early on as a as a youngster, and uh, uh, set my sights. On getting into the radio business, which I did uh, a couple of weeks after high school graduation. Uh, I started in radio at age 18. I did it full-time all through college uh, in Scranton, Wilkes-Barre, where uh, I am from, where I was born and raised, and, uh, you know, worked on the air for the first couple of years and realized that, uh, you know, I, I, I had an interest in uh, the business side of the radio business uh, and knew that I was uh, uh, a, a, an, an adequate broadcaster but uh, really uh, a modest air talent. And uh, my ear uh, advanced enough that I recognized that uh, uh, the career path for me would be better if I moved into sales, which I did uh, really uh, probably uh, in 19 or 20 years old, moved into sales as uh, I guess a sophomore, the end of my sophomore year in college and it just took off for me from there. By my senior year in college, uh, I knew that that was the path for me. I, I had a, a pretty good level of success. And uh, you know, my senior year in college, I made more money than my father, uh, who was a history teacher. And uh, my parents knew that that was uh, uh, the direction for me. So I graduated college in 1981, and uh, like so many uh, young, young people from the Pocono area, uh, Scranton, Wilkes-Barre, and the Poconos, uh, you know, we have our sights down the turnpike at Philadelphia. It's such a, a big and beautiful city, uh, so close by. New York is really just as close. It's, a, it's actually, on a mileage basis, a little bit closer, but people like uh, Philadelphia, uh, you know, when you're from Pennsylvania and from upstate PA. And I came to Philadelphia with the idea that I was going to find myself a, a, a job at famous 56 WFIL and I knocked on their door and they hired me and I graduated college on a Saturday in May in 1981 and started at WFIL uh, the following Monday. You know it's interesting because uh, our careers kind of parallel each other but uh, my experience is that people in sales tend to go into management that that is the the path that you, you've chosen and so let me introduce you as the CEO of the most successful independent uh, FM station radio station in the entire country uh, WBEB known as more FM and when I came to work here and this was my very first job while I was still in college it was WDVR it became uh, uh, easy 101 WEAZ EAZ that's correct now it's WBEB and you're the boss and uh, I guess the question is, how has this station maintained? And by the way, let me go back for a second. I did start working November of 1963. This station had gone on the air in May of 1963. By the time I got here, and it wasn't here, by the way, it was a, a couple of rented rooms in Germantown where the studio was. They were already in the top 10 of FM stations in the country, uh, in the city rather, and no FM station had ever cracked that top 10 before. 
and it has been that successful ever since. Explain that to us. How do you do that? You know, uh, it, 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 I guess part of the, the, the really the, the, special, uh, the special sauce that Jerry Lee introduced here, uh, and, and along, along with, uh, you know, Mr. Kurtz, uh, his partner, uh, but Jerry had a great love uh, and appreciation and an understanding of audience research, of market research. So we built our house on figuring out what it was the listeners of the marketplace wanted and, you know, setting our sights on delivering it. Mm. And it, it really, it, you know, it's simple but not easy. It's one of those things where if you figure that out and, and you, you serve your listeners first, you'll serve your advertisers best. And that was the thing that, you know, on all my years of, of not working here, because, you know, their 54-year history, I've only been a part of the radio station since uh, the end of, of 2015. Uh, I, I was hired to come in as the, the president and CEO, and uh, a great honor to take over the helm uh, after, uh, you know, Jerry was kind enough to uh, allow me to have that position. Uh, so, uh, you know, their history was rich and uh, already well, very well established. I spent most of my career competing with this radio station and understanding from afar uh, the great commitment that they had to research, to marketing, and uh, to trying to figure out how to connect the dots. Uh, simple but not easy is, is a great way to uh, really explain it. And uh, you know we figured out what the audience wanted and did our best to deliver it. And continue to do that. Yes, and continue to do that. You know, of the interesting things that, you know, from afar, again, until I joined the company, uh, you know, you had mentioned the call letters earlier on and when you started. Uh, the radio station uh, basically has been in the format of serving adults for 54 years. And, you know, we've changed our on-air name four different times uh, over that time. And, you know, radio stations changing their names isn't anything so special or so spectacular. But it's normally done at a time when the radio station is getting clobbered, uh, when the radio station needs to make a change because the, the things that it's doing uh, perhaps can be better uh, directed in another way. Each time that we've changed, we've been number one in our space. You know, and I admired it when I would say like, wow, they just blew up that radio station, yet they raised the bar even higher. Today, the radio station enjoys two million listeners. Uh, it's, it's, it's a feat that has never been achieved in Philadelphia radio before. Uh, I will tell you, it's not our record because at Christmas time, uh, you know, we are the leaders in the space, not just here in Philadelphia with Christmas music, but across the country. And uh, at, 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 on some years and at some, some periods of time, some weeks during the Christmas season, we achieved three million listeners. But Three, Many of those on the internet, is, uh, 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 both on the internet and uh, uh, you know over the air and uh, uh, through any platform that we offer our our content distribution. Mm -hmm. But the fact of the matter is, uh, my point in 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 doing it here is no Philly station has ever crossed two million, and uh, we're we're you know out to beat our own records. Uh, the number two station in the market has a, cum a cumulative audience of about a million two or a million three, so. We have like a 50% advantage over over the the number two in the space. Okay, now you watch that for 38 well, of your 39 years. Many uh, years, yes. Many for, years. You watch that, and you competed against it. I and, I did. And you look at it and you say, well, what are they doing? That I how did, so nobody else has figured it out. How how are, well, are you able to? How have they been able to to do that for so many years? You, you know, I don't know if it's a case of figuring it out or if it's a case of the willingness to invest the resources that are necessary to get the job done. You know, you take risks. Uh, you know, you, people see our successes, but, you know, we're in the laboratory in the back room trying to figure out just what it is that, that makes it uh, special and keeps the momentum going. And the research isn't, uh, isn't always easy and isn't always something that you want to see. So, you know, the research directs you and changes uh, your attitude and philosophy about things. And fortunately for me, in my past experience, I, I, I spent many years uh, as the chief operating officer of a, of a company in Scranton, Wilkesbury called uh, Time Shamrock, uh, you know, a privately held radio company. Uh, and I was the COO, oversaw the radio division. We had 15 stations. They, they're, they're still in business and they're a wonderful company. They've been, they've been in the radio business since the first year of commercial radio, since 1922, to their credit. Uh, 
uh, it's a family owned company in upstate PA. And I had the privilege of running the radio division for 10 years till I got recruited to CBS about 11 years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, but anyway, uh, at that company, um, you know, we had five different markets that, that I was responsible for, and we did research in every one of our markets. So that company really is the one that opened my door to an understanding or opened my, uh, broadened my horizons, I should say, to an understanding in uh, market research mm -hmm. and uh, how to properly uh, ask the right questions to the right people to determine the right information to make the radio station move in a better direction, serve more mm -hmm. listeners, and in fact, then be a better vehicle for advertisers okay and and you learned that there I and did. yet and yet when you come to Philadelphia and work at OGL and you're looking at, uh, up the street here at uh, at uh, uh, busy B 101 yes or more FM I'm yes sorry. well it was both more, it, yeah, it, it more it, FM uh, you look at it and you still can't quite come up with with whatever it is they figured out, you're still having uh, well, an issue. Well, I, I will say, you know, uh, in each case at, at WOGL, uh, there was a, and there is a great staff of broadcasters there. Uh, it's, a, it's a wonderful radio station, and it's a different format, of course. You know, it's a classic hit station, uh, you know, and it was called Oldies back then when I went there, and we evolved the name uh, during my time. And, you know, the radio station was uh, successful, but I, I will share that it was 14th in the market when I went there, and it, it was number one when I left. Uh, so, uh, you know, I, I, I checked the box that yeah, it was no, a good, it was I, yeah, a good I'm run. I'm not suggesting for a moment that you... Uh, that you uh, aren't, aren't successful. Oh, oh no, do. no, no, no. But, yeah. but what I mean is a, a very successful station in its own right with a fantastic yeah. team of broadcasters. And there also, uh, we did extensive market research and did things. But we looked over at WBEB uh, as a station that set the standard. You know, whatever resources we had for research, this was a radio station that had double or triple, uh, in some cases quadruple. Yeah. Uh, when I, when I, talk about my background and, and our and parallel nature of our careers, we're talking about the same station, but I moved into television, and I wonder if it's uh, fair to uh, compare uh, Action News, Channel 6 in Philadelphia, with the other stations, uh, and the inability of the other stations to capture the market quite the way Channel 6 does, or quite the way, quite, quite the way uh, that BEB does, that, that you guys somehow have figured out something and even though we're looking at you and we're doing the research, can't quite qu catch you. Well, you know, uh, I suppose that it's a, it's a fair comparison. I, mm -hmm. I, I wouldn't profess to be a television expert. I can certainly appreciate it and uh, uh, know it as an insider in the business. But, um, you know, they certainly have been very successful. I know here it was a combination of market research, uh, you know, a good staff, hard work, um, some luck. Uh, of course, uh, you know, and uh, knowing, uh, you know, the instinct, Jerry had tremendous instinct, and his instinct uh, guided the station, I'm sure. Uh, he had a steady hand uh, and a lot of times took risks that other people just probably wouldn't, wouldn't take. Or, you know, if they were in a corporate setting, wouldn't be able to take because the company wouldn't be willing to either make the investment or take the risks. You know, that's been a case for us that is been to our advantage because we've been able to make a decision based on what's in the best interest of our listeners, the best interest of our company, and all the people that make the decision are right here in this room. You know, we make it and we implement it. Yeah. I guess to, to kind of be specific about this, so when I joined the station in 1963, uh, I called it elevator music. I'm not sure what it officially was called, but it played in elevators. Uh, I, they, at that point, created radios that they gave out to doctors and dentists to put into the office that didn't carry any other station. The only station on there was Fixed DVR. frequency radios. Yeah, yes. and they would put that radio in and it would play and it was background music. We have one in our lunchroom here. Uh, uh, really, one of the yes. original ones. I yes. wish I had that. Yeah. In any event, uh, but now it's 50 years later, 50 whatever, odd years later, you were going at a, an audience back in 1963. That audience isn't the same audience in 73, 83, 93, 03, 13. How do you decide who the audience is each time? Well, you know, uh, the marketplace decides. The marketplace sort of decides what the target demographic is. In, in most of America now, uh, and really has been for 25 or, or 30 years, the target demographic is either adults 25 to 54, 
or women 25 to 54. And you know, it's a difficult thing for a radio station to target that demo because it's a 30 year span. And you know, you would often say, does a 25 year old like what a 55 year old likes? And in most cases, the answer is no. You know, uh, they're such different, it, it, it's a family reunion. Uh, I, I often said when I worked for a station that had sort of a narrow skew. So a lot of radio stations sort of look to slice and dice that demo find a group inside, find a space, an age cell inside there where they can make a living, where the, way, the lane might be wide enough for them to drive their radio station down, uh, where they can you know, expand upon it from there. Uh, but you know, this is a radio station who set its sights first on women uh, you know, and then on adults and, and men with it. But in women, uh, you know, that has been uh, you know, the, what we've built our house on here. Uh, we target women 25 to 54, and we really do reach the whole broad group, which is amazing. Our format is called adult contemporary, and there's a lot of adult contemporary stations that either work on the younger end of the demo, you know, 25 to 35, or the older end of the demo, 35 to 55. And there's even some that slice it, dice it even further, you know what I mean, just get inside a little narrow piece of it. But, you know, we set our sights here on the whole group, and uh, we do our research on the whole group. We, we research every aspect of the radio station, our library of music that we play over and over again, uh, our current songs that we play that represent the pop favorites uh, that are in the marketplace today. We research those. And of course, then the overall feel for the station and, and how we're doing satisfying the wants. We want, we want a, a, a mom to be able to be in the car and listen and enjoy this radio station and make it feel, make her feel good. And at the same time, not be embarrassed that her children are in the back seat. Uh, we want to be able to be a family radio station that still delivers uh, a good time experience uh, for, the, for, the, for the mom. Now, my me memory, which often fails me, uh, uh, <laughs> may be incorrect in this, but it seems to me, and at some point, uh, Jerry Lee joined us here on Pioneers of, of yes, uh, Philadelphia of course. Broadcasting. And I seem to recall- He, he said, would warrant a seat here a lot more than I would. Well, and it, but it seems to me he, he talked in terms of uh, aiming at a 40-year-old woman yes. as, as the kind of focus. Yes. Okay, that's still, even though you're going 25 he, to- Yes, yeah, and, and you know, there was a period of time, and he was one of the leaders in this space where, you know, we would even put up a picture. Now, we didn't necessarily do it here, but in this format, we would put up a picture of that woman. Some, some stations gave her a name. Some stations changed their name of the station to be that person's name, you know, right. with stations that were called an Alice or a Mary or whatever. Well, uh, and we even had one for a brief period in Philadelphia that tried to compete with WBEB. So yes, the 40-year-old woman would represent sort of the sweet spot, the middle of that. And because of that, we, we have a, 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 a focus on the 40 to 55-year-old and a focus on the 25 to 40-year-old. So we look at the both halves of that hopefully with it coming together and delivering that 40-year-old person. The issue, I would think, is that music changes. It does. And so uh, if you're 25, you're listening to completely different music than your 54-year-old uh, mother, maybe. Well, you know, the belief sort of has been that sometime in your teen years, between the ages of 14 and 17, 16 years old thereabouts, you're sort of cast, your die is cast as the type of music that you like. Uh -huh. And while you might be open-minded to something new or you might be open to changing along the way, that sort of that music from that period of your life becomes sort of the basis of it. So it depends really on, on what type of, uh, you know, a radio station it might be that is attracted to you or that you are attracted to. But, you know, in us, we're in the pop space, so it gives us the opportunity to continually uh, feature those artists that were a part of that and we'll test them and make sure that the audience still wants to hear them and at the same time to still introduce uh, the newer songs too but by we we're by the time we play them they're tried and true hits you know yeah. and, and you're we, not breaking any music that's here. that's correct in, in in some cases when it's an artist that's really core like in our in our wheelhouse right now an artist like Adele is somebody that's very popular with our listeners and you know might test through the roof in our research projects might but uh, you could play almost anything she yes, presents to yes yes i want to change the subject slightly uh, and to uh, point out that the philadelphia inquirer recently did this thing tuned out about radio uh, let's start with your reaction to 
They're, essentially, they're saying things are changing and people aren't listening to radio quite the way they did. Uh, what are your thoughts on this? Well, you know, the first thing that I, I'll, I'll lead with here is that our radio station has two million listeners mm -hmm. and something that a Philadelphia radio station has never achieved. Right. So, you know, our ratings tell us, the ratings that the advertising industry purchases, uh, Nielsen ratings, tell us that, you know, they're mistaken. Uh, while they're a fine publication, the one thing that is certain their uh, circulation, you know, isn't going up. Uh, the, the daily newspaper business is, is a tough business. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, their circulation is really going in the other direction. Every promotion that they do and uh, every contest that they run and, and things like that are just to try and slow the decline, uh, the, the, the busyness of people today and the, you know, how many people still get the paper delivered to their house every day, and those that get it, then how many, how many read it? While I think there's a place for the daily paper, and I don't think it's ever going to go away, the newspaper and the radio have been arch competitors since you and I were in, in the crib. But I think we can agree that the technology has changed things. So, for example, if that, my familiarity with television, and so when I started here in Philadelphia, there were four t TV stations. And then 29 and 17 came along. And there were, now on cable, I don't know how many hundreds of TV stations I have. Nice. They don't offer the same thing in terms of local news, but it's different. Uh, again, uh, radio uh, didn't have to deal with Sirius, didn't have to deal with, with satellite radio and those sorts of things. And even in the car, I can drive my car now, and I don't necessarily have to listen to radio, I can listen to Pandora. Whatever. Yes. And I guess what I'm saying is there's no question how successful you are. And, and I understand that newspapers are having problems even greater than television stations are. Or, or, right. But they're clearly the, the, media, the media, all media, is changing. It is. Okay. Is there a concern? That's my question. How much concern do you have? You know, uh, I, I don't want to sound uh, cavalier and say, uh, you know, there's, there's nothing and, and, uh, and, and fluff it off. Yeah. Uh, because there is m more of everything. Not, uh, not just here at More FM. There's more of everything that sure. we all deal with. More media. You know, uh, the Internet has greatly changed things. And, and, and things are different, certainly. Today, I have a 20-year-old daughter, and she has far more media choices than I had growing up. And, and I understand that. Yeah. But you know, our belief uh, at this radio station, and, and in general, and I'll give you my belief with it, is that if you continue to make relevant local content, the listeners in your marketplace will seek them out. You know, like Sirius and XM, for instance. Mm -hmm. I happen to be a subscriber to Sirius and XM. I, I, I have it in a couple of cars. Uh, and, and I'll tell you, not just even you know, the free trial. I yeah. renewed it and kept yeah. it going because there's stations on there that I really like a lot. And uh, some of the uh, specialty stations you know, uh, I enjoy on the weekend or I'll enjoy from time to time tuning them in. Uh, and I will tell you, as an old radio guy, I have a bunch of friends that work at Sirius and XM, so sure. uh, I enjoy uh, listening you know, to their stations and the, the stations that they're involved in. But in my opinion, what I've found has happened is Sirius and XM has really helped local radio that does it right because what it's done is is reignited the passion for radio in a lot of people. People that, that got it all of a sudden they were they had this unique new service. You know, there's nothing new about the radio business. There's nothing and in some cases I guess it could be said it's not sexy. Uh, we become like a utility to people. We're like the water company. You know, they turn it on when they want to use it. They turn it off when they don't. They take it for granted that it's going to be there. Mm -hmm. And while that's comforting and wonderful, what we need in radio more than perhaps uh, a lot of other industries need is maybe a greater focus on our, on our own PR because I don't think we do a good enough job of touting uh, our own success. But I will tell you, the Sirius and XM thing, if you were to look across America, they have about an eight share across America. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I liken it sort of to USA Today. USA Today is the number one newspaper in America, but it's got like a, a three share or a five share in every city. Mm -hmm. And most of the time you don't read it unless you're getting on a plane or staying in a hotel or, mm -hmm. or away for something special. Mm -hmm. And in each town, the local paper tends to do a little bit better, some varying degrees of success. The radio stations that have been able to stay local 
and to stay live and to not be automated and to not be syndicated and to not be out of town, you know, broadcast the same show in a hundred cities, to not be a jock in a box, to not be a computer voice uh, that, that made the commitment to local, to stay local, to stay relevant, you know, and then also the commitment to technological advances. You know, we're, we believe in, uh, here at WBEB, we're platform agno agnostic. You know, we have an app, uh, you can listen to us online, you can listen to us through our own app, you can listen to us through our website, on your desktop, through your smartphone, on the radio, uh, through your Wi-Fi at home if you have an internet radio. And we've made the decisions to affiliate with those providers so that we can be enjoyed and received that way. And like a, lo a lot of other broadcasters, don't deliver the same kind of a listening experience when you listen online and you listen through the smartphone or you listen on the internet. They plug in different commercials. They sound choppy because they're trying to create a new revenue stream. And while all of us would like to find another way to ring a cash register, uh, again, I, I believe that the station that serves its listeners first serves its advertisers best. And as a listener, I could tell you that when I listen, I'm a radio geek and I listen a lot. So when I listen through those other devices and it's choppy and it doesn't sound right and the commercials are different and it doesn't sound the same, then I, don't, I look at it as a less than listening experience. So we've made the commitment to have one signal. So when you listen, if you listen on your iPad or you listen in your office or you listen in your car or you could get in your car and drive to the gym and then take your phone and plug your headset into your phone and while you're on the treadmill, you're hearing the exact same thing, not a different signal. So whatever's working for you is working very well. It's working for us. Has continued to work all these years. Even that little radio you have in the lunch area that only gets 101.1. That's correct. Okay. Jim, thank you very much for being with us. We really appreciate it. It is, uh, I guess it's fair to say now that uh, more FM is like soft pretzels or tasty cakes here in Philadelphia. It is part of the environment. Well, we don't take it for granted. Uh, it's a great honor to be uh, as successful as we are in Philadelphia. We want to continue to earn the trust of our listeners every day. And uh, there's a great staff of people here that work very hard to make this radio station what it is. Thank you again for being with us. Thank, Thank you, you for being with us. And we'll see you next time. Take care.